I witnessed seeing these entire fields that had been harvested already, but looked like they hadn't been. And so just really started to ask a lot of questions about um, why this was happening. Um, would overhear a lot of conversations um, from my husband dealing with their grocery store partners and um, customers who would reject product because it didn't look perfect in some way. You know, the carrots and the peppers you see here, I sort of call like the, the poster children of imperfect produce. Um, and so sometimes it has to do with things being unique in size or shape or color. Um, but a lot of this waste has to do with things that are potentially off color, like I mentioned, with the cauliflower or off size with the romaine lettuce. Um, sometimes it just has a lot to do with surplus crop. So um, farms will plant, um, you know, a lot more than they potentially will need because they're uncertain of how weather will affect um, how much they actually are able to harvest. And so sometimes they have a lot left over. So um, as a result, you know, nearly 6 billion pounds of produce alone are wasted due to imperfections. Um, and then, you know, at coming back here to Cleveland and seeing uh, just at surrounding our family's wholesale produce business is essentially a food desert. And so for me, um, just looking at sort of the contrast between both of these issues, you know, too much produce and not enough produce for others um, brought me to decide to create this program. Um, so what we do every week is we buy up uh, these imperfect fruits and vegetables. Sometimes they might be a little blemished on the outside, but they're perfectly fresh and have just as many nutritional benefits as a beautiful looking piece of fruit or vegetable. Um, but we buy up all these items from local wholesalers and local farms, primarily in the summer growing months and as long as we can throughout the year. And we bring them to our facility and we pack them into boxes of different sizes that our customers go online and they order um, what is the best option for them. They can pick um, a mini or a small or a large box. They can pick how often they'd like to get it once a month, once every week, once every other week. And then we deliver it right to their doorstep, um, which presently is working in our benefit. Um, so we're, you know, helping farmers and wholesalers make sure they get paid for ha their hard work and that they're able to sell all of their inventory. Um, to date, we estimate that since 2016, when we began in May, we've rescued over a million and a half pounds of produce. Um, and so a huge piece of this, um, I guess, leading to the social enterprise part of what we do um, is that we also are making donations to local food pantries every week. Um, this is sort of built into just our regular process. So we're sort of using the buying powder power of our customer to purchase additional produce. And then we work with our partners at local food pantries who come and pick that up from us every week. Um, in 2019, we donated about 70,000 pounds of produce, primarily through our friends at the Hunger Network of Greater Cleveland. But we have a great partnership with um, former NFL player Josh Cribbs, and we do some food pantries with them and distributions um, around the holiday time. And there's always people in need of produce, and presently we're hearing from more and more folks who are asking for our assistance. Um, and so we know that providing healthy food access is just a piece of the puzzle when it um, comes to improving health. A large part of it also has to do with educating people uh, on how to use fresh fruits and vegetables, how to prepare them. Um, and so from the very beginning, I wanted to include a recipe piece of this um, to give people an idea of something they can make with the produce that they're getting in their box. Because we know that sometimes some of the things that people are getting, maybe they're a little unfamiliar with. Um, and so typically we'll feature something that is maybe the most unusual item. Um, right now we're partnering with local restaurants or we have been this first part of this year to 
showcase and sort of shine the spotlight on what local chefs are doing. And so sort of Food Network style, we bring uh, Chopped, if you watch the show Chopped, it's sort of like that. We bring them a box and they create something delicious with it. And then we post their recipe on our blog so that our customers can recreate that in their own home. And then we take pretty pictures and we share that with the restaurant so they can show off what they're doing as well. Um, and then we also feature just customer recipes and um, local bloggers who are doing work with their boxes. And then um, we sort of rotate through that right now. And those all live on our library of recipes on our blog that's called Ugly Food Makeover. And we hear a lot from folks that um, they like the challenge of sort of getting new fruits and vegetables to their doorstep that they maybe wouldn't typically buy at the grocery store. It's challenging their family to try new things and eat more vegetables and their kids are excited to open the box and then figure out what to do with it. Um, and then we do a lot of work with our friends at Rust Belt Riders who uh, picks up all of our food waste each week that is not edible. So anything that we sort through that is, um, you know, too far past the point of us being able to use it, we put the, that into special bins. They come pick that up and turn it into compost to produce soil to grow new food. So I call it the circle of food and we're completing that circle and closing that gap with, with their work. Um, we also do a lot in the community to provide education about nutrition, we do cooking demonstrations, and um, we'll go to classrooms and talk with children, brains, you know, show them what ugly fruits and vegetables look like and um, let them taste them and, and discover that they taste just the same as a perfect looking fruit or vegetable. And then we're just educating them about the food waste issue and then really um, helping them brainstorm um, ideas for how they can reduce food waste in their own home or in their school or their workplace. And then we also have strong partnerships with local employers where we um, are able to provide discount codes for the employers to share with their employees. And uh, we deliver our boxes to their office where they can pick that up and bring it home and they save a little bit on the delivery fee. Um, right now, those are sort of on hold as most people are working from home. And so we've done a lot of shuffling around this week of people's addresses from offices to homes. Um, and that's been interesting. Um, so that picture on uh, my left is a photo from the early 1900s of my husband's family. Uh, there in the middle with the large tie is Sam Weingart, who was the founder of uh, our family's business, which was called Forest City Weingart Produce, which was created in 1900 at the Cleveland Produce Terminal in downtown Cleveland, um, which is not too far from like um, the um, Cleveland State University and um, the community. Um, well, I can't, I think straight right now, the, the community um, college there. So um, I mentioned sort of the details before of how I came into the business. Um, whoops. We, um, I created Perfectly Imperfect there at Forest City. Um, it was never going to be a business. It was really just going to be a program of our family's company to help our bottom line to reduce waste within our own business, potentially help farmers that we were working with and suppliers to take some of those imperfect products and have a home for them um, and also other wholesalers at the market. Um, I didn't know I was actually getting myself into running <laughs> my own company, um, but it was an interesting start because um, as soon as we got going, I think actually our first customer was Betsy Kling from WKYC. And she saw us start up our Twitter page and was signed up. And suddenly we had WKYC calling us to come out and do a report about what we were doing to reduce food waste. And um, we, I think at the time, probably only had like 10 customers the first week. Um, so it kind of took on like this own life and, um, it quickly outgrew the walls of our family's wholesale business. 
And um, sadly, in 2017, after 117 years in business, our, our family's wholesale business closed its doors. And that's sort of a story for another day, but essentially has to do with just the changing grocery environment and um, how many you know, local companies now sell fruits and vegetables, um, you know, Costco, Target, you name it, you, Amazon, you can get your fruits and vegetables. And, and those people aren't buying from local wholesalers. They're bringing their own produce in directly from um, California and Florida. Um, and so our family's business closed in uh, 2017, and that was about a year into our service. And we really, I was left with the decision of, you know, what do we do now? Is this sort of experience that I just chalk up for the next thing? Um, and we were really just encouraged strongly to keep it going. And so that was when I took on this huge challenge of officially running this as its own business. Uh, my husband went off to work for another company and I created um, what is now from seed to spoon LLC and perfectly imperfect produce is a program um, that we do business as perfectly imperfect produce. We work out of a facility now called Produce Packaging, um, which recently moved in um, the end of last year out to Willoughby Hills. For a while, we were at East 77th in Carnegie, not too far from Case, um, and where all you guys normally get to be. Um, so we're out there, and it's a perfect setup for us. I don't have my own building. I don't want my own building because then I have a lot more overhead. We utilize the amazing people at Produce Packaging um, to help us pack our boxes. They're highly trained in food safety and we have the ability to use their storage space, their cooler space, um, and their trucks and all of their forklifts and all of their um, all the things that we need to do our job. And so it's really a perfect setup for us. Um, my team is made up of all women leading this. Um, Laura West there on the bottom came to us um, with a background in farming and she now heads up all our operations and has uh, built a lot of strong partnerships for us with other farms. And so, um, as I said earlier, we really strive to buy first from local farms. Right now, there's not a ton of selection um, locally, but we are still getting local root vegetables and um, a little bit of apples even still from last growing season um, and some local lettuce from hoop houses, things like that. And we're excited for the, the new growing season to come in. Um, and then Jody Mitchell is, uh, manages all of our employer partnerships and community relations. Um, getting out in the community at health fairs to spread the word about what we're doing. So we delivered all those regions in the orange. We launched in Columbus last year, which um, could be growing faster if we were to put more effort into it. We have so much still we need to accomplish up here in Northeast Ohio, but we had so much demand from people down in Columbus that we um, decided to add that on and we do have plans for further expansion um, in the coming months. We've been fortunate that we've gotten a ton of free press coverage. We have an easy story for people to tell and so um, it's amazing because we don't have a, a huge marketing budget to work with so we're always glad to share our story um, with, with media. That's just sort of a glimpse of our all of our some of our little items marketing pieces we have a refrigerated vehicle that we take to events that i call it the veggie mobile um hopefully i would like to convert that into sort of a mobile market for people to actually come to that vehicle and buy um, produce sort of farm market style from there right now we use it more for bulk deliveries um, for schools and until this week restaurants um, so we are packing up about 500 boxes a week. This week it was higher than that because we've seen an increase in demand. Um, we're res rescuing about you know, 10,000 pounds of produce and we donate about 1,000 pounds of that every week. I don't know if you'd like me to stop there, Megan, as, and sort of let the other um, folks ask questions or if you want me to kind of dive into some other thoughts about life as an entrepreneur um, 
you let me know how you'd like to proceed because I feel like I've been talking for a long time already. <laughs> That's okay. Um, do you want to, I know you just have a couple slides left. Do you want to kind of just, you know, tell the students, you know, a little bit about being an entrepreneur, a little bit about that, and then we'll give Mel a chance to talk about uh, We Can Code It and her journey. Yeah. So I think I kind of gave you like more this background here about how I came into this business. Um, you know, I would say right now, the biggest challenges for me are time. Uh, I have three children who are 12, 10, and seven. And so they still need my attention more than ever. Um, and so just as a mom running a business, um, that is is, is huge and um, not wanting to let anyone down, both my family and my customers. So um, as an entrepreneur, it's really just, you know, a matter of taking for me, taking one task at a time, especially right now in this new world that we're all trying to figure out um, what needs to happen first. Um, for us, Capital has been a challenge. Um, we haven't really had any investors or taken out any huge loans. Um, we've sort of quote unquote bootstrapped this. And um, my background is in marketing, not in financial um, items. So I am trying to my very best to manage all of those things um, to the best of my ability. So far, I think we've done pretty well. Um, we do have some competition out there. When I started this program up, I, you know, wasn't really honestly totally aware of all the different uh, options out there in this um, space, but I feel so far um, people here in Cleveland and Northeast Ohio are very local, um, loyal to locally run companies, and so I think that's worked in our favor, and um, so that hasn't been a huge challenge, but something that's sort of growing as we grow. Um, I mentioned in terms of successes, the media support that we've received has really been um, enormously beneficial um, and then happy customers because for us, um, the, the best um, marketing tool has really been word of mouth from customers who are passionate about what we do and want to share um, about us and share the you know, delicious things they're making with the produce that they get from our boxes. And so um, that's been hugely beneficial. Um, so as far as just like tips, you know, I would say briefly, I mean, I could probably talk about this for an hour, but, um, you know, I think it's important to have your priorities straight so that you can kind of keep your focus on a daily basis. You know, for me, I try to put myself um, high on the priority list because I feel like it's important that we take care of ourselves um, so that we can do an even better job taking care of our family and our customers. So I start every day um, at 5 a.m. I go to the gym so that I can kind of get my stress out and then I feel focused for the rest of the day. Um, and then just in terms of, of passion, you know, so I think whatever it might be um, to, you know, the budding entrepreneurs out there that you feel you're passionate about. Um, you know, maybe it seems a little cliche to say, but like, this is not just passion. Like I have this great idea that I really want to make happen. For me, I've learned that the passion has to be so great that you're willing to put in so many hours that, you know, it might mean, you know, missing things that you would like to be at for your family, perhaps, or spending weekends doing work instead of going on a trip with friends. It might mean, you know, it means being so passionate about something that you are willing to jump over every hurdle that is required, not just in the short term, but potentially for years without paying yourself, months and years. Um, I'm just getting to the point now and we're three years in where I'm able to pay myself. And so I think that that's something that um, entrepreneurs may be, you know, when you have an idea that you think is, is you are so in love with that um, you will do anything for, I think um, it's just, we may not realize just how long it's going to take us to get to that point where we're able to even um, compensate ourselves properly for all this time and energy that we're putting in. 
Um, and then just grit. You know, I think in the beginning, um, you know, there's no one to get, delegate to. You're doing everything yourself. It's for me, it's been, you know, moving lots of heavy boxes of produce, loading up trucks, you know, being at events in the hot sun, you know, um, just doing everything yourself. Um, and no matter how much passion you have, that can sometimes become daunting. Um, and then, you know, just grit in terms of like, you're going to have people who don't understand um, what your passion is, maybe because they aren't as passionate about it themselves, but they might call you crazy. They might, you know, roll their eyes a little bit, but having that much grit that you're willing to stand up um, to the naysayers and just continue to do your thing and go after your goal. Um, and then just, you know, having the guts to not care what they say. Um, and more importantly, I guess, to not let yourself talk yourself out of what you're after. Um, I think that's the heart of it as, uh, as an entrepreneur, you know, I think it's sort of a roller coaster ride of emotions. Um, one day feeling like, you know, I'm killing this. I am like accomplishing so many of my goals and I'm, this is all happening. And then perhaps the next hour, even, you know, wanting to close up shop and say, forget it, I'm done. You know, I can't handle mean customers. I, you know, um, whatever it might be, but really just having the guts and the grit to withstand all of that and, and get up every day and, and start over. Um, because once you've gotten yourself in so far, you can't, you can't give up. Um, because then I think, um, you know, like for example, when our family's business closed, I thought that was the end and really it was just the beginning of something even better and everything has changed so much since then. And I'm so thankful that on many occasions where, those thoughts crossed my mind of, you know, walking away and going to work for somebody who could just pay me a steady, you know, paycheck um, that I'm proud that I stuck with it and that my team members have continued to, um, you know, stick with it. And um, that's what life as an entrepreneur is. It's, um, you know, continuing to fight for your goals um, and being able to stand up to even yourself as a naysayer and continue to move forward. So um, that's a little bit about our business and um, what we're all about. So I can't wait to hear questions you have. Thank later. you so much, Ashley. Um, we really appreciate uh, you telling, you sharing your story and sharing your advice. Um, I don't know if you don't mind stopping sharing your screen. Um, I'd like to give Mel a chance to, to tell her story and um, to talk a little bit about We Can Code It. I wanted to have both of you here today because I really feel like social entrepreneurship is not one size fits all. And we often think about it and start thinking, all right, well, what, what can a for-profit company possibly do that you know, is gonna have an impact on people? And maybe we think of food waste, but we don't think about the impact um, that an organization can have um, on on role models or on well-being, and so I wanted to have Mel here today to also tell her story and give us another side to um, another another view uh, from a social entrepreneur. Absolutely, thanks for having me, and thank you everybody for joining. Um, and I'm not, I will tell you the truth, Ashley, I loved your presentation. And when I, I pulled one up too, um, it, I don't think it's as good as yours, but we're gonna try to give it a shot. Are you guys okay with that? Let's do it. All right, let's do it. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna share my screen and let's do this. All right, can you see me here? Yep. All right, let's go for this. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. I have been a software developer for 20 odd years uh, and the odd is uh, appropriate in all contexts. Um, the, uh, I am a grad of Case Western. Actually, I got my undergrad uh, degree in anthropology and psychology. So a uh, very different um, take when I got out into the world and realized that I, uh, anthropology and psychology weren't paying the bills and I was stuck in a cubicle um, uh, doing real estate appraisals instead. Wasn't really what I wanted to be doing, doing in life. 
So um, went back to school and uh, started on a degree in computer science um, and did that during the evening while I was, uh, while I was doing appraisals during the day. Um, I have always been into computers. Um, I'm going to, my, this hasn't been, uh, give me one second. We're just going to go this way. I was always into computers. Um, as a kid, my dad brought home a Commodore 64 and um, really only had a word processing program on there, which I quickly got bored with. So I opened up the manual and learned programming. I had no idea I was learning how to program, but I was learning how to program. Uh, and my first program just had my name looping over and over, Melanie, 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 Melanie. And I thought it was the coolest thing because as a kid, nobody pays attention to you, nobody, you can't tell anybody what to do. So the computer was doing my bidding. And I thought, wow, this is awesome. Um, got out of it in high school, again, didn't, uh, uh, undergrad degree really felt left out um, of computer science. I thought these folks don't look like me. I, uh, when I went back to grad school and started there, um, I was the only woman in my class. Uh, so it was, uh, I, you know, I, I didn't feel welcomed. And that's part of the reason um, that after 20 some years that um, dealing with software development, having my own software development company, um, always having a foot in education, always teaching somewhere, uh, that I decided to open up We Can Code It. We Can Code It is, um, our mission is championing social equity through technology. Our vision is to graduate 10,000 champions, we call them champions, um, in software development by 2030, 70% of whom are considered underrepresented in tech. Uh, that is, what we're trying to do is change the face of technology so that everybody feels uh, like they are welcome here. So here's the problem. More jobs in tech exist than can be filled through traditional routes. People just don't, a lot of women, a lot of people of color do not see themselves in tech and do not have the role models out there to say, this is a job for me. Um, traditional education is often too expensive for folks. Um, and not everybody is um, blessed with having uh, the resources to attend. Um, ultimately, a lot of women and people of color feel left out of tech. Um, I won't show you this video. This is uh, my COO, Lauren Holloway. At that point in time, she was uh, uh, our student success program manager. Here's a really amazing student from our Columbus campus. But our solution to this problem of people being left out are the uh, and not really having the resources to attend college while helping them switch over to uh, a career in software development or coding boot camps that really do focus on uh, people who have been left out. So very collaborative approach to coding boot camps in a very, very quick fashion and then helping our students um, get jobs at the end. Uh, I'll show you here, this is the proven process. Oops, let's see if I can zoom in on this picture. Nope, not so much. Anyway, um, we have a proven process that we can code it. We assess the fit of our candidates. They get a test and they get an interview. And if they're accepted and we like them and they like us, we invite them to become a developer um, apprentice with us. And we take them through 14 to 16 weeks of real world, hard core kind of drinking out of the fire hose. Um, collaborative uh, skill building in computer science, including either Java or C Sharp, which are backbones of computer science, sort of the Swiss Army knife tools of uh, computer science, uh, as well as front end skills like HTML, CSS, JavaScript. And we teach them to use uh, Agile, um, which is a methodology of uh, sort of project management for chaotic projects like computer science projects. Um, and we teach them Scrum, we teach them skills that go along with programming, and then we teach them career skills and help our students become employed. Um, we give them engagement with employers, and at the end of the day, 94% of our students are, who are career seeking are placed within six months of graduation. So we are incredibly proud of these results. A lot of times folks are coming in, they're starting maybe 
as an Uber driver or this economy right now uh, and where we might be headed, looks like we're headed, is a lot of folks are losing their job in the hospitality industries and the travel industries. Um, they would be able to come in and get reskilled very rapidly and get back out into the workforce quickly, um, earning typically mid 50s to start. In a few years, they head off and they'll be considered mid-level to, uh, to senior level developers sometimes making six figures or more. Um, and they are able to continue to act as role models for others and obviously help support their family while employers um, from a really big picture perspective are getting diverse uh, folks in their companies um, who are really helping um, them uh, profit, you know, really reach out to new markets, increase uh, profitability in their organizations. A lot of these things are linked to diversity in organizations. So we, we help them so they're not just getting one viewpoint from a developer or a, a web developer, software developer, UI, UX developer. Um, some of our students, for example, um, we started our first boot camp in 2015. Uh, one of my students from the fall of 2015, she now works at Microsoft. She's um, doing really well. Um, we have success stories like that all over the place. And that's what makes me um, continue the hard fight that Ashley was talking about, right? And I'm sure she has the same kind of vibe going on. She sees some results and it, it is it's pretty amazing. There's another one of our students, again, another video. I, I hope that you'll have the opportunity to check out some of our student stories on YouTube on your own time. I don't want to um, bore you with them by playing. This is Juan. He's at Progressive now. Um, he was a bike mechanic before he came to We Can Code It. Now he's a developer at Progressive, and he has a really nice, uh, earns a really nice living and has a nice work-life balance. So um, we have... Oh, here we go. Um, it's employers who have uh, diverse, inclusive teams are 45% likelier to increase their profits and 70% likelier to capture new markets than employers who don't. Um, that's from uh, Harvard Business Review, uh, How Diversity Can Drive Innovation, and the other one's a USA Today story. Um, there's, there's more recent uh, information on this, but there's real science and uh, behind this. Our students go to places like Microsoft, IBM, Chase. We have a lot of Chase students. Um, Lean Dog, some smaller companies as well. Progressive Highland, you'll recognize some of these. Um, hundreds and hundreds of employer partners that are hiring our students. So the model works. There's Jane. Uh, she is uh, a hiring manager at, at Progressive talking about We Can Code It. You can find that video on YouTube. Um, right now we have campuses in Cleveland and Columbus. Um, we are uh, doing some things and I'd love to talk about the timeliness of reskilling and, and being in this uh, real small segment that is uh, um, expected to uh, deal, uh, do pretty well in hard times, like a, a reskilling education company like ours. Um, we are going to be um, offering, we can code it to all of Ohio very shortly in something we're calling remote code. And I'll talk about that. But right now we're Cleveland, Columbus. We have actual physical campuses in both locations. Our Columbus, Cleveland, we started March 9th of 2015. That was the beginning of our first boot camp. It's like having a baby. You don't forget the date. Uh, Columbus was October 16th of 2016. And we are continuing to open up more campuses um, throughout, throughout the nation. Um, we have awards. We have gotten best boot camp four years in a row, which I'm very proud of. Um, uh, I've gotten some awards around here, which I feel very fortunate that anyone even cares about my story. So thank you all for listening. Um, we give our students give back to the community. This is um, one of our, uh, this is a presentation I've, I, I continue to do at Women in Tech events on uh, test driven development and agile development and the like. And I hope they're not all as bored as they looked. Actually, it was very interactive and we were playing with Legos. So I, I think this, uh, I think they were entertained and learned something along the way too. Our students give back. Um, it might, some of our students, Ashley, would probably love to work with you. That we always have students who are, are um, we, they have a demo day at the end of their uh, time with us and they create their own, their own projects and often their projects have to do with social, um, solving social 
uh, problems. Uh, th our, uh, this particular uh, group of students worked with a food pantry down in Columbus to help them create an application, an online application where their constituents could uh, pre-order the necessary food items they needed. Um, and that led to a decrease of waiting in line for two hours often uh, for each participant down to just picking up their food in minutes. So, uh, you know, who doesn't want that kind of uh, service? And I think the least of us should have access to, um, you know, to, to items like that as well. Um, our team, this is a little old, but we're growing. Uh, there's 16 of us um, between two campuses. Um, and I think, I think Megan will recognize this last picture. Um, the, uh, <laughs> she does. That's her sister. <laughs> that's her sister. Um, you know, we have, uh, that's basically uh, in a nutshell what we do. Um, my, where my passion is, you see, I want everyone to be involved in tech and to really be able to um, take advantage of the um, work-life balance, the high pay, the respect, um, obviously right now the ability to work remotely, um, support their families uh, in tough times and in good times as well. So um, as well as act as role models for future generations and um, to really, you know, once you you know, if people wanted to take a leadership route within their company to really get into positions of power where they can, they can affect other people's lives as well and, and sort of continue on. Um, so that's that. And Thank yeah, you. anything. Yeah. Thank anything you so else? much, Mel. Um, You're welcome. I just, I've heard your story before and I, it just, it always, um, really the most touching part for me is how you started this whole organization to create role models in the community because you can't imagine yourself being something until you've seen somebody else in that role. And right. I think that's just really important, especially when we're talking about um, tech jobs. Right. So, yeah. Um, Thank you. I have one question for the two of you. And then um, while I'm doing that, if other people have questions, if you can throw them in the chat, um, I will ask the questions um, to Mel and Ashley. Um, but uh, while you're doing that, you know, Right now, we're all kind of dealing with this, uh, you know, coronavirus and being quarantined. And I'm wondering how your organizations have had to had to adapt, and how, what kind of opportunities you see moving forward. Ashley, would you like me to go? Or you want to go? Go ahead. Sure. Um, Reskilling is one of the industries that seems uh, seems to do. Um, fare pretty well in difficult economies like we're in right now. However, given that we are also, uh, we've had to move very quickly, um, moving our students to, uh, from in-person working collaboratively on teams together to a remote environment where they're working collaboratively on teams together and building out projects. Um, and it's been very interesting and very successful. Then actually in a way, um, this offers some benefits. They're learning how to use remote pair programming tools, a lot of rem other remote tools that will help them out. Um, so they're learning additional things than they, they might have in our in-person program. Um, we have responded by allowing our, um, our staff to choose where they want to work, from home or from the office. Everybody's choosing to work from home. Uh, students are mandated to work from home. That was actually a state mandate. However, we, before the state came out with it, mandated it, we already pulled that trigger and said, we're, we're going remote. This is, uh, there's no reason for all of us to put each other at jeopardy in our families and community at jeopardy right now. Um, we have taken, we have a few modules that are online because we have a few different programs. And one of them is called Flex Code, where it's part online, part remote. Um, we have modules right now that we are getting ready to introduce to the public for free in order for them to reskill themselves and at least gain some additional skills during this time in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, those, uh, we're building it out right now. We're finishing it up um, and releasing it. And you'll start hearing radio ads on Urban One and NPR in Cleveland and Columbus about um, how to get free access to this. So we're doing that as a community service to help folks reskill. Um, we are 
working with the Neighborhood Transformation Initiative in Cleveland to ensure that folks from uh, really um, poorer neighborhoods have access to computers, and we're trying to train them up as well. Um, we are working with all of our constituents to make sure that if they are training through us that we have we can give them proper access to computers and finally we're we developed a program based on this new remote model that is still a collaborative learning model and it's called remote code and we are going to be releasing that for our May start date and future start dates as well where it is a fully virtual that actually not only helps students um, who are trying to reskill in a really difficult, almost quarantine time, um, so that they can use, you know, utilize their time to, to gain new full stack uh, software development skills. Um, and we, it also helps us as a company and helps my employees so that they feel secure in this market. So we have another option there and we can um, start opening up to new markets pretty quickly and easily without opening up campuses. So this sort of forced our hand to pull the trigger on that. Um, so we're trying to make lemonade out of lemons here for everybody. That's what we're doing, yeah. Awesome, so I'll jump in there. This week has been um, a, a lot for us to sort of adjust um, and um, make things work for our customers. So I mentioned earlier that a lot of our, a lot of our customers have their boxes um, delivered to their office. And so a lot of, a lot of folks um, have their offices closed down this week. So we've done a lot of shuffling of addresses, things like that. Um, that hasn't been a huge deal. Um, one of the things that uh, also happened this week for us was that obviously with schools closed, um, we can't make deliveries to schools anymore. And um, we have a strong partnership specifically with Canton Local School District, um, which surrounding that area is um, considered a food desert. So we've been really proud of the work that we've been doing in partnership with them to help families um, who are getting boxes delivered from us um, to the school for them to pick up and the school had to shut that down. And so we're now offering delivery to their home at a reduced delivery fee. Um, we, when we first, I guess, gosh, everything's been changing so quickly. It's hard, hard to remember what's happened day to day, but probably a week ago we said, what can we do to make sure people um, can get fresh food to their homes if they can't leave their house and how can we make this even easier for everybody? So we, we, um, created a, an offer for free delivery for the first box um, for subscription orders over $20. Um, and that has made a huge impact for a lot of people who maybe were hesitant to buy from us because they were not wanting to pay a delivery fee. Um, and so this week we have seen a huge amount of new customers come in. So we're so thrilled about that. Um, the food, everything is just changing so quickly, but prices are higher right now because I think primarily because of the just uncertainty of what is going to happen in the marketplace. And so produce prices are higher. So we had to work even harder at the beginning of this week to sort of figure out um, what we would have to supply our customers that was still a good combination of different items. As the week has transpired, now we are seeing from a huge amount of restaurants and wholesale suppliers who formerly were serving restaurants that they just have so much inventory, they don't know what they're going to do with it. So this coming week is going to be really um, important for us to, um, you know, swoop in and do what we do and, and try to move as much of that product from um, wholesalers and restaurants as we possibly can. So we're hoping that um, we'll also be met with additional customers who are willing to help, help you know, find a home for those items. And so um, we're busier than we've ever been, which is great. Um, I think, you know, our solution to, um, providing fresh food right to your door. It happens to be very timely. Um, we're, I'm, you know, have a lot of friends in the restaurant industry who it's just, you know, so sad to hear them closing their doors. So we're doing whatever we possibly can to help them, but we feel very fortunate that we are here to provide this service at this really important time. 
Um, we all typically are working remotely from different places. Um, Laura, you know, working with our farm contacts, Jody out in the community. Um, so we're still continuing to do what we do from home. Um, Wednesdays, we have to be at our packing facility. That's when all the magic happens. Um, so yesterday, all of our boxes were packed up. Today, they're all being delivered all over the area. So I'm sorry if I'm distracted with questions from uh, our delivery folks here, but um, it's been an interesting week. And I think, um, you know, as this continues to evolve, um, you know, I'm interested to find out, um, you know, how things are going to continue to change for us, you know, as a food supplier, I think that hopefully um, we will continue to be able to do whatever, you know, we need to be doing to ensure that the public has the food that they need um, to stay healthy. And um, so there's a lot going on. Those are just a few yeah. things that, that we've been doing this week. Thank you so much. Um, I do have some questions here. So from Travis Johnson for both speakers, um, even when you had your initial jobs, did you know you wanted to have an impact in the community or was this something that developed once you had gained more experience? I've always been interested in, in you know, people and helping people in systems. I like um, thinking in large systems, a uh, systems approach. And I think um, from that aspect, I've been interested. My folks, they have been entrepreneurs. I've seen it around me. So I've had role models. Um, so I'm not going to neglect that that has made an impact on my life. But um, overall, um, it was organic in nature. We can code it was organic in nature, if that answers the question. Yeah, I mean, I think I've always had the entrepreneurial bug, if you will. Um, I um, sort of tinkered in a few things when I was um, home with my kids. I, I left my job in advertising. Um, I loved the company I worked for, but I was fortunate enough that I was able to to leave and raise my kids, you know, be here with them all the time when they were little. Um, but I always um, was just the kind of person who had ideas. And if my husband were here, he'd be shaking his head like, you know, I'm always like, well, what if we did this? And so when I served up the idea of Perfectly Imperfect, it was one of those moments. It was just sort of like, well, what if we tried this? And I think at the time he was probably like, oh God, here she goes again. Um, but um, I think he also knew it was, um, you know, a, a, a good idea that would be impactful. Um, and again, I didn't know I was starting a business at that time, but I think that, um, you know, that just idea of, you know, not necessarily going into things with what, you know, you, that you want to run a business, but having an idea that truly is impactful and letting that drive everything else. Um, so yeah, I, I had a couple small businesses that were really just my way of staying creative while I was home with my kids. It was hard for me to be home with them all the time. Um, I loved it. I'm lucky and happy I got to have that opportunity. Um, but absolutely, I always had that that passion to do something that made a difference um, in the world. Um, and we're lucky we've been able to make that happen. Great. Um, from Rosalind, what do you think is the biggest challenge unique to social entrepreneurship that other entrepreneurs might not have to face? It's a tough one. I'm Did sorry. you ask both of us? I'm sorry. I, I sort of, I'm trying to look for the question here. Oh, that's okay. Um, what do you think is the biggest challenge unique to social entrepreneurship oh. that yeah. other entrepreneurs might not have to face? Easy. It is easy question. We have two masters. We have our social mission and our profit. And wow, is that a difficult decision sometimes. And sometimes uh, you have to make hard choices based on that. Do you, if we can't hit our social goals, let's say we have, we are not hitting our 70% of our students as uh, underrepresented in tech. Do we 
you know, how do we do that? How do you manage that with marketing dollars? How do you manage that with uh, limited enrollment sometimes? Uh, do you, you know, what do you do? And it's always, um, I think it's extreme, extraordinarily difficult. Um, I see a, a few questions in here that sort of uh, relate to that. And that is, um, that's a biggie from my perspective. I think if you're a straight up entrepreneur, it's all about profit. When you're a social entrepreneur, you often have a, a different kind of mission as well. Yeah, I would ag agree with that. You know, staying true to our mission is so at the core of, you know, why I wake up every day. And, you know, I, if it were up to me, I would be able to donate even more produce every week. Um, but I also now I'm like having to pay attention to the bottom line. And so, um, you know, it's, it's definitely a, a, a hard balance to, um, to walk. And so, um, but I, I feel fortunate that, that I get to do it because how cool to be able to earn a living off of something that is making an impact and that we're passionate about in the world. Great. Here's another one um, for both of you. Since both of your companies have expanded to regions outside of Northeast Ohio, what changes, if any, did you make to your business models to adapt to the specific needs of your new markets? Uh, you know, from our perspective, it, um, it wasn't necessarily the business model. It was tightening up our processes so that we could have a common, um, strong thread uh, that is we can code it with the we can code it brand the we can code it way, you know, um, and we continue to tighten that up, you know, it's it's difficult to um, have staff, um, different staff, different, um, you know, educators, different folks going on in two different locations and keep everything, um, keep the quality the same uh, in both places. And that was the hardest part from my perspective. Mm -hmm. I would say for us, we're still sort of learning the art of, of that. Um, I think people here in Cleveland really relate to us and our mission because we um, were born and raised here, you know, and um, we are on the ground here and the farms that we're buying from are primarily up in this area. And so I think the challenge for us is that we are such a small team um, that's probably one of our biggest challenges to, is to be able to really staff ourselves properly. If, if I could do it again, I, you know, would have somebody on the ground there in Columbus. Um, and so I think, yeah, one of the challenges as a small business, as an entrepreneur is like, you know, just as I was saying before is time. And so um, it's sort of like having to pick what you do first. Um, and it seems like a lot of the time, all those things that have to be done first then prevent you from getting to the, the things that you know and want to be doing. And so for this year, um, going into it, things are looking very different at the moment, but um, my goal has been to really do a better job of embracing, you know, the Columbus community and really getting to know restaurants better down there and working with our blogger partners more, um, and so that's definitely something that um, is on my list of goals for this year. Mel, this question's for you um, from Andy Sawyers. Uh, you've described how the education that you provide is different due to its collaborative nature. What is the most successful project that you've assigned in class and how much do you change the projects from year to year? You know, we assign certain projects. There, um, we're always reviewing projects and updating our curriculum and the like. Um, however, the final projects are the ones that the students choose themselves to do and the most successful projects from there, because we've had, we've had, um, you know, reuse, uh, food reuse projects. Those are very, um, I love those. So I love that Ashley's here. Um, I love the food bank project. I think that was a phenomenal project because that is still in use today. They didn't just create it and then walk away from it. They created, they still st support that code and they still support that organization. Um, there have been projects that, that the students have come up with um, ranging from, you know, uh, making sure your children are safe and, and um, 
you know, tracking them to a certain extent uh, through food bank, through uh, community engagement, through, um, you know, social platforms, through yoga, um, exercise apps, things like that. So I think they're all very interesting. We've had folks just, you know, like bar crawls, you know, <laughs> type of apps as well. So, you know, they're not, all of them aren't necessarily uh, altruistic in nature. Some of them are simply fun and interesting, um, but I like the food bank project. So I'm going to say that's, that's my favorite that they came up with. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Um, I have another one for both of you. How has the increased transparency in today's world with social media changed the social entrepreneurship market? Hmm. I well, never had it before it, so I don't know how it's not, you know, changed. I know both Ashley and I sound like we've had a lot of media coverage and a lot guessing for me, we've had a lot of feel good stories. So mm -hmm. people share our stories and the like, um, Ashley, I'm curious about what yeah, you I'll chime say. in. Um, I would say, you know, I feel like we have always been very transparent. We sort of show every week on our social media behind the scenes, um, what we're what we're packing, you know, what we're up to. We we show ourselves like doing farm pickups during the high season. Um, you know, I, I I feel like we have a pretty close knit relationship with our customers, and as it grows, that evolves. Um, but we started in the age of social media, um, and so we've we've always been very transparent, and um, I think we're all about sort of keeping it real. And so that's what we do. Uh, we don't try to make things look perfect. Um, we're fine with just being genuine and being who we really are. And I think our customers can relate to that. So um, that's just who we are already. <laughs> Um, Mary Kate asks, I commend you both for the work you guys do. It's making a positive impact on the world and it's truly amazing or truly inspiring. It's easy to get caught up in the stress of day-to-day -day life. So I was wondering if you have any particularly rewarding moments that have made you realize that all of the hard work that you've put in has been worth it. If so, what are they? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go answer. first this time. Yeah. I'll answer. Um, wow. I mean, there's so many experiences like that. And, and those are the experiences that keep us going. You know, like I was saying before, that keep, keep me from not giving up. Um, you know, a few of them are just, you know, the opportunity to make our donations in person on occasion, interacting with people who are the end result of all of our hard work, because at the end of the day, that's truly what this is all about is improving healthy food access for everybody. So to be bringing these donations that are, you know, come from our customers because they wouldn't be able to take place if it weren't for them. Um, and to really see um, the look on someone's face that isn't used to being able to have fresh fruits and vegetables is huge. Um, hearing from parents who are telling us that their, you know, their kids are eating vegetables that they, you know, wouldn't normally try. Hearing from people who have lost 50 pounds, um, talking to farmers about you know, how we're helping their bottom line and really, you know, making all their hard work worthwhile. Um, you know, there was an experience I had this summer where I got to visit um, an Amish farm that was a new supplier for us and um, seeing, you know, just the, the way of life that they have and, and for, you know, giving them a check for what seemed like not much, but to them was, was a lot. Um, I think in every step of our process, there's stories like that, that, um, you know, help reinforce why we're doing all this hard work. And, uh, and then also just seeing in my children, um, also the, the pride that they have for, for what their mom is doing. And, um, there's a lot of guilt that comes for me with the amount of time and energy I spend on work. And so to have them, uh, express their, you know, their excitement for things that I'm doing is also a point of um, affirmation, I guess, for me. I'll, I'll go. Um, you know, I, it is hard. I, I really, really get this question because it is hard to, um, when you're in the thick of things to stop and step back and say, wow, look at how far I've come. Look at how far we've come. 
Um, and I'm not that person by nature. I'm not uh, somebody who's like, yeah, yeah, and always cheering myself on. I'm usually um, trying to solve the next problem and uh, not really celebrating successes a lot. When I do uh, feel particularly um, proud and get goosebumps, you know, get that feeling. It's when I, I hear from students who have graduated and they're telling me their stories and they're off and I hear that they're, um, you know, have a great job at Chase or, you know, they're now able to support their families or I hear from their, um, you know, a sibling comes through the boot camp and says, yeah, and tells me about their success. Um, you know, when they reach out to me on social media and, um, you know, just thank me, or when I hear them write a re when I see a review on, you know, uh, Google or course reporter on any of these sites, and they're just um, talking about what a great experience they have, then once in a while, I allow myself to feel, um, you know, to sense it in the big picture and say, yeah, yeah, this is cool. I've done it. So, yeah. It is a tough question. And it's hard to, uh, to, celebrate ourselves and focus on our high points. But um, I, I appreciate that question um, from Mary Kate. I think we have time for one more. Um, so from Sean, uh, we know that the most businesses today have the ultimate goal of making a profit. Although this isn't bad, if those profits were further reinvested into the company rather than given to the stakeholders, the company would be able to grow at a higher rate. What do you believe is the best way in getting companies to not be as money centric and focus on providing value and solving problems? <laughs> okay. So it depends on the purpose of the company, right? You know, are you looking for a fast exit? What, what is the purpose here? You know, so you have to look at it from a strategic standpoint a little bit. Um, we invest a lot of our money back into growth versus, you know, it's, it's like any other investment. Um, you're asking it for more of a, a social standpoint, and it looks like slight value ju judgment here in the sense of um, how, you know, maybe some folks, how do we invest them back in to grow them? Um, it's not everybody's goal. Um, so I don't know about convincing anyone else. Um, what do I believe is the best way to get them not to be money centric and to focus on providing value and solving problems? Education. Um, helping folks who might not understand the investment um, back into the company could help them grow and show them maybe if they're money focused, show them how economically this might help them. Um, so if I'm looking at this as a very literal question, I think that would be the best way. I, you know, you try to inspire people and you try to show them that it doesn't have to be about money, but some people that's what their main focus is. And I don't, you know, it just is. Um, but I would show them that, you know, educate them and show them that investing back in your company can actually um, help them in whatever goals they have, um, even if it's not an altruistic goal, you know. Right. Yeah, I would say absolutely education as well. Um, so when I had this idea to create this program, um, you know, some of the some of the people in our family's wholesale business may not have been on board with it. It might have seemed to them just like an extra expense, an extra risk perhaps. Um, but when I spent the time to really educate um, the leadership within our own company about the things that I was seeing in the marketplace and the potential opportunities to help our community, um, I think that really helped bring them on board with what I wanted to accomplish. And then at the end of the day, um, you know, I think it, it just, it all comes for full circle and ends up bringing new business in that, um, you know, from new folks who may not have heard of us. And then suddenly we had this new program. Um, so yeah, I think it's providing the facts in a motivating way based on the audience that you're um, trying to persuade it make those changes. Great. Well, thank you so much to both of you for taking this time out of your day to be here with us, with our class, with our extended audience. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, it was wonderful to be able to have two such strong women and social entrepreneurs here in class with us today. Um, I know that I didn't get to everybody's questions, so I did save the chat. So maybe I can um, I can email them out to, to Ashley and Mel, and then when you have time, you can uh, answer the rest of the questions and we can get them back to the students. But 
Um, I'm sure Michael has a, a few things he wants to say to close yeah. out the class. I just wanted to say, say thank you, Ashley and Mel, for doing this with us as, as we adjust to the new reality of online teaching and learning, and Megan um, for, for moderating a great partner in this. Um, and for the community members that were able to join, I know I saw some faces, um, some familiar and some not familiar, um, and um, I'm really pleased that we're able to sort of take advantage of this opportunity to kind of open up our class to a broader audience. Um, we'll be back uh, a week, next week on Tuesday um, with Adrian Bota, who is the um, founder of a company called Origin Milk. For those students, you also may have gone to Piccadilly Ice Cream or Yogurt, um, the ice cream place near campus and Yogurt. He also founded those, although he's not the owner of them now. And um, so we'll have Adrian and then next Thursday, also at one o'clock, we'll have Mike Belsito, who is a colleague here at Weatherhead, was the founder of eFuneral, um, a local startup, and is now running um, a product collective um, that has an industry conference. And again, this theme of kind of how folks are impacted by the crisis, I think we all recognize that this, these questions about navigating during this climate are, this is gonna be with us for a while, and I think it's gonna impact different entrepreneurs in different ways. So um, today was a great start to a number of these conversations and look forward to having them for the semester. So again, Ashley, Mel, thank you so much for doing it. And students, um, I'm glad, I know some of you are still transitioning back home, but hope you do it safely and you made it home safely. And um, we will see you back in class uh, next Tuesday. Thank you guys. Thanks everybody. Thank yes. you. Take care. Thank you, Ashley and Mel. I know this week is really hectic, so we really appreciate it. Absolutely. Take care, everybody be you safe. Too. Good All right. Bye. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mel. Thank you.